My name is Lizzie. Hi. I'm kind of freaking out about this like sonic echo around me. Um, I work at a company called Mapbox. Who in here has heard of Mapbox before? All right, cool. So um, at Mapbox, we build um, developer tools for making web maps. Um, and one of the, there's a lot of, you know, mapping companies. Some of you may have heard of Esri, um, CartoDB, uh, Apple, Google. Uh, these are all mapping companies. Uh, one of the things that we try to do at Mapbox is instead of building an end user product, we build different tools that you can kind of put together on top of each other and um, sew together or CEO is calling them Lego blocks, um, put them together to build applications. Uh, and we build on open source components and there's just like a ton of interesting stuff. Um, I was a little stressed out about the two hour slot, but then I realized that I could really talk for a long time about the whole Mapbox deck. And at 11 p.m. last night, I um, realized that like the talk I had, I didn't really like um, because it was just like kind of meandery and strange and whatever. So um, I rewrote it a whole bunch of times, and then you know I made I felt bad, and then I was like, you know, whatever, it's cool. Like writer's block happens, we can figure it out somehow. Um, so I kind of just went stream of consciousness starting at 11 o'clock last night, and I came up with this talk. So I apologize if parts are disjointed or if my slides don't work or if it's not like totally seamless. But I think it's going to be a much more, I've never talked this way before, I think it's going to be really interesting. Organic. Organic, indeed. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Um, I, what I would rather, instead of like a bunch of questions at the end, if I'm saying something and if I'm going to explain a bunch of like concepts, if something doesn't make sense, like please raise your hand, interrupt me um, in the middle while I'm talking, which is like, not normal conference behavior, but I'd much prefer that like we clear out anything confusing when it's happening. Um, and if you have a question but you're feeling cautious about raising your hand, I guarantee you someone else also has that question and they also feel nervous about raising their hand. So I encourage you to just go for it um, because this is a small room, we're all friends and maps are super cool. So the more we can understand about them, the better. Um, so my goal is I'm going to, I want you to walk away with an under, with the, 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 my goal today is for you to walk away understanding a little bit more about open source web mapping than you knew before you came in this room, and maybe a little bit about Mapbox too, which is the company I work for. Um, I also want to reinforce the idea that like maps are really hard, like really, really hard. I do support and a lot of times we get emails from people saying, I'm not a developer, I don't really know anything about computers or technology, but I want to add a map to my website. Can you do that for me? And the answer, we try to find a really nice way to say no <laughs> because they're you know, complicated and technical, but it's like totally worth it once you start to see how the pieces fit together. Um, so like keep digging in even when it gets confusing. Um, so I thought what we could do is actually just start with one of my favorite web maps that one of my colleagues made and kind of walk through how it was made and what the different pieces are that fit together. I think it's a pretty representative example of the like, Lego pieces of open source web maps and web mapping tools. And um, so we'll go through that and kind of see it in pieces. Um, if you would like to follow along with this presentation, I just put it online, uh, so I didn't put the URL on the slides, but it's, um, my name, lizzydiamond.com slash osb-maps. Um, and I can like write it on that white order if you want. But um, I'll also make sure to like put it, give it to you all at the end too, so you can go back and look. Um, so there's a lot of like links and interesting stuff. Oh, um, uh, yeah, lizzydiamond.com slash osb-maps. And then you can use the left and right arrows to um, switch slides. So one thing that I couldn't get to work properly in this format was iframes. Apologies in advance, they're a little bit weird. But So this is a really awesome, amazing, super cool web map that one of my colleagues made. Um, the idea is that you have a starting location in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> and you have an ending location in Washington, D.C. And you want to get there via Capital Bike Share, which is the bike sharing program in, in Washington, D.C. So what this map, with map slash application allows you to do is change your starting location. It finds the nearest bike share. It shows you walking directions and how many bikes are at that station. And then it shows you a bicycle route to the uh, capital bike share station closest to your destination. Incredibly handy if you're walking around DC and you want to get from point A to point B. Super useful. 
Um, and there's a lot of different little components and pieces to this that make it all work together. So we can walk through them and kind of see how it works. Um, so let's talk about what's going on here. So first of all, the entire map itself is housed on the web page in a, in a map container, in a div on the page. Um, and the reason that we have a map container, a place for all of this functionality and styling and everything to go, is because of the web mapping library that we're using uh, here, which is called Mapbox.js. Um, it's a JavaScript library, and it contains a ton of useful web mapping functions, everything like a map constructor, and panning ability, and zoom ability, and interaction. Um, and its uh, main function, like the core of what it does, is it loads map tiles. Who here has heard of a map tile before? Nice, awesome. Um, but some of you are asking, what are map tiles? And that's a very good question. Um, I would be happy to tell you, but you can also stare at this adorable puppy for a second, just like take that all in. Like I said, 11 p.m. Um, so let's go back in time for a second. Let's go back to 1996. Who remembers when MapQuest launched its web service in 96? Who was like totally blown away by this idea? It's insane, right? Like, it, there was actual directions that you could get from the internet from point A to point B. Like, that was huge. And it was online. I was like, what? Crazy. Awesome. But it was really, really slow. And I mean, not even just slow because the internet was a lot slower in 1996, but slow even compared to the speed of the internet. Um, every time you wanted to move around the map, you had to refresh the entire page and load an entire new image that was like one block over from where you were looking. Um, and it was, and you couldn't pan on the map. It was always aligned to the same boundaries. And then in 2005 came Google Maps, and Google Maps kind of revolutionized everything with its beautiful interface. Um, and like. But what was actually innovative about it? Was it, it, it wasn't the interface, it, it wasn't really the red marker or the little weather widget. No, it was none of those things, it, it was the tile. So in particular, a raster tile. Raster tiles are 256 by 256 pixel PNG files that are stored on the server and then served to the browser on request when you're looking at a particular location on the map. Each tile is one piece of the map in a big grid of pieces which, as you can imagine, loads a lot faster. So if you can think of this as like the base of you know, the underlying imagery that's not interactive, but it's um, an image that shows base layers. Um, and this kind of map is kind of what they call a slippy map. Who's heard the term slippy map before? A slippy map is a map that you can pan and drag around. Um, so only the tiles in the current map view are requested and loaded instead of trying to load the entire world at that zoom level, which if you imagine, you know, on one page view, there's about 15 map tiles that are being loaded on every every section. Um, this is just San Francisco. It takes 15 tiles at this zoom to make San Francisco. Imagine how many tiles that would take for the entire world at this zoom. And then imagine if you had to load them all at the same time. That would be really, really slow. So um, modern web maps are super hella fast because we have these awesome kick-ass map tiles. Um, and raster tiles are available at preset zoom levels, and there's a different tile set at each zoom. So these are pre-generated um, zoom levels. If any of you are familiar with you know, GIS software, you kind of have an infinite scale. Like you, can, you can make your scale whatever you'd like it to be between reality and the map. Uh, I, with web maps, you have one set of preset zoom levels. Zoom level zero is one tile for the entire world. That would be zoom level zero. If you ever like go into Google Maps or whatever and zoom all the way out, you see the world repeated over and over and over and over and over again. That's one tile for the whole world. So the number of tiles in the grid is related to this function. So two to the zoom times two to the zoom. So two to the zero is one times two to the zero, which is one, which is one, is so one tile for the world. So at zoom level one, you have two to the one, which is two, times two to the one, which is two, four tiles for the world. And then it increases exponentially in powers of two from there. Um, you'll notice that the world in the view of the web map is square. Um, we already know that like taking a three-dimensional thing and putting it on a two-dimensional thing adds distortion. In order to make 
the world square, we actually don't, the web maps you see don't go all the way up to 90 degrees north and 90 degrees south. They stop at 85. Um, and this is so that the tiles can make a perfect square. And you know, computers really dig binary math. That they can do it really quickly. It makes it really um, efficient for a computer to load a square rather than any other uh, dimensional rectangle or any other shape. Um, and also, it helps for being able to locate very quickly where you are in the grid and which tiles you need to load. So this is a map projection called Web Mercator. Um, the Mercator projection uh, map is like the most common one you see, the one where Greenland is like huge and the same size as Africa. Um, and like horribly distorted and you see it in classrooms all the time and cartographers hate it. But um, web maps love it and Google made that choice in 2005 to go with Web Mercator and you can get a lot of really fun fights on the internet with like old school cartographers about how much they hate web maps because they have to look at this ugly thing all the time when there's no doubt. Um, but I digress. Um, so zoom levels two, three, four, and five are increasing exponentially. Um, and you know, like I said, this was really useful. And it was really innovative in 2005, right? Like, all of a sudden, you weren't panning massive images over and over and over again. Um, but it's also really limiting. You have 20 preset zoom levels, and you can't really get anything in between. If you're trying to get, you know, your city, and it looks too small at zoom level 8, but too, doesn't fit on the screen at zoom level 9, like, that sucks for you, and you kind of have to deal with that. Um, but more recently, the web mapping world has graduated to what we call vector tiles. And this is this open source specification. It was created by one of my crazy evil genius coworkers who like sits and just hacks on stuff all day in the middle of nowhere. And like, literally he lives in like a farm in Winthrop, Washington. And like just sits and writes code all day. It's crazy, it's awesome. I, I kinda want that way. Sounds really cool. Um, so vector tiles are a similar idea to raster tiles. You're still taking a bunch of information and tiling it. Um, but instead of creating tiled images, we're creating tiled vector data that can be then dynamically styled in the browser, which is really fascinating when you think about, like, OK, now that you have all this vector data, you have all of these options for how you can style it and render it on the page, the newest of which is um, using GL. Um, using WebGL, you, we can actually do like crazy rendering, fast, tilty, super awesome fractional zoom stuff. That's like kind of kind of blows my mind. But so when I say vector data, I'm talking about roads, parks, water bodies, bike paths, points of interest, state boundaries. All of these <coughs> exist as geographic vector data, points, lines, and polygons that have an associated coordinate pair with them. Lot two, lot two. Or if it's a line, it has a bunch of coordinate pairs in order. You can draw from one point to the next, to the next, to the next. And then a polygon is the same thing, but the first and the last point are repeated so that it makes a full shape. Um, and all of the vector data, in addition to just having a location, also has attributes attached to it. So a road might have a name. It might have a uh, speed limit. It might have the number of lanes. It might have who maintains it. All this information is packed in with the vector data. And that's really useful because you can use that information also to style the vector data. And so if you make a choice and say, you know, I do want to style my roads based on the number of lanes, you can do that. And then if you later say, I, don't, I no longer want that information or I would like to style from different information, you can do that because the vector tile is actually retaining all of that information inside of the, the data format which is, and, and um, so one data format is GeoJSON. Um, that is a geographic data format that is really common in web mapping because it's an extension of JSON, JavaScript object notation, which means it's just JavaScript, which means no translation has to happen, and it can just all happen magically. This is the stuff that I find really fascinating that most people find really boring, so I apologize for talking about it a bunch. But um, I'm gonna do it anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so uh, vector tiles, uh, they store all of this information, the vectors, the locations, and the attributes as a protocol buffer format, um, or PDF, which is a binary format, and it's super lightweight and super compact. Because you would think, OK, storing an image, cool, versus storing a bunch of vector information. Like, you'd think the vector information is going to be bigger, because it has a lot more data associated with it. But no, it's not, because of this awesome, sweet format that makes it really compact and lightweight. Um, and so then vector tiles load really quickly, and then you have all these dynamic styling options with it. 
So this is like the future. Um, yes? How exactly do they like break the vector maps into tiles? Uh, the question was how exactly do they break the vector maps into tiles? Um, one tool that um, we have at Mapbox is called Mapbox Studio. And it is a desktop application that has two purposes. One is to design tiles for vector uh, tiles. But the other one is actually to take this data. And what it does is it, um, just like we have, you know, you have the preset zoom levels for um, raster tiles, vector tiles also have preset zoom levels. So what it does is it takes the vector data and it makes the same grid with, you know, zoom level zero is one tile for the world. But instead of putting it all in all, the whole image on one tile, it passes all that vector data into one tile for the world. So it's geolocated, right? So it's the same kind of tile boundaries as you would have in uh, with raster tiles. But then it, it does it with vector tiles as well. And it actually gets really um, annoying if you have like really dense vector data and you're trying to show a lot of dense or store a lot of dense data all over the world because then those those tiles actually get very heavy. I don't know if that answered your question like completely because you have to kind of see it. Okay. And like the problem too is that like vector tiles you can't like we try to visualize them but it's like binary data. It's hard to like conceptualize. I'd be happy to talk more about it too in a time where I can right. think more clearly about it um, and that better way to explain it. But I appreciate that question. It's a great question. Um, so vector tiles are one of the super awesome open source components of web maps, and they're actually like the foundation, right? Like we put these tiles on a map, all of a sudden that's what we think of when we think of a map, is that something with like information on it that we can see that is visual and geographic. Um, Mapbox.js is what makes it possible for us to add tiles to our map container. Um, so if we go back to our example here, um, we have these map tiles that are sitting underneath uh, this this data, the routes data, right? It's got parks, it's got labels, it's got roads, and actually, interestingly, it has these green bike lanes, which is really helpful and useful if you're, you know, using a bike app. Yes. So these tiles are separate, like you might have a layer or a set of road tiles, a set of park tiles, you of can. Bike route tiles. You can. Um, the nice thing about vector tiles is that you can take a bunch of vector data and then make one tile set that includes all the vector data. So you can make like a road tile and a parks tile, or you can style all of that information together into one style that includes multiple layers of vector data. It's a little bit it's a little bit confusing. But um, the way so the data layers that are making up these tiles, um, it's actually a curated vector data set uh, that Mapbox created. It's a combination of OpenStreetMap data and natural earth data. We call it Mapbox Streets. Um, and it, it basically contains all of the data in OpenStreetMap plus some vector terrain from natural earth. And in Mapbox Studio, if you use the program, it comes preloaded with all of that data. So you don't have to worry about adding it. You can just go ahead and style it right away, um, which is super convenient if you want to just like make a map because then all the data is right there and you don't have to worry about data wrangling, which is like, what is the statistic everyone throws around? Like data problems are 80% of work spent programming or something, like data munging and trying to conform things. So if you don't have to worry about that, it makes it really helpful and useful and awesome. Um, so yes, these tiles were made with the Mapbox Streets data set. And you can see it has bike lanes in it too, in addition to like the things that you might normally quote unquote expect to see, roads, parks, that kind of thing, water bodies. Um, and um, yeah, so I think I maybe already answered the question, but these map tiles came from, um, was it where these map tiles come from? They seem to be highlighting bike routes, this is true. And it highlights capital bike share stations as well on that map, so they're like little um, green dots here. But um, these are actually not part of the underlying tile set. They are uh, overlaid data, which we'll see in a second, because we actually interact with them. Um, as opposed to the um, underlying tiles, which we don't interact with. Um, while they are created from vector data with a style applied, by the time they're in your browser, they're rendered as images. So they're not interactive. Um, yeah, not interactive, or interactive and not part of the underlying style. And also, I think they're quite aesthetically pleasing. Like, they're, you know, really pretty. Making pretty maps is really hard. It's really easy to make super ugly maps. Um, way easier than it should be, honestly. Um, 
So, and these tiles were created with our desktop design tool, Mapbox Studio. Um, this is what Studio looks like. Um, Studio has a bunch of data, like I said, that comes preloaded with it. And then using a styling language called Cardo CSS, you can then pick out individual layers, like I want all of my streets to be gray, and I want them to have line width four pixels. And then you also can do conditional styling at different zoom levels. So you might not want to show every road label when you're zoomed way out at zoom level one because then literally your entire map would just be road labels. Um, and Studio has some like built-in stuff in there to like make sure you don't do things like that. Like it, they, it won't show, this one, it won't show water features above zoom level or below zoom level 12 or something because it, they know that it would just like totally overwhelm your map. You can override it too if you want to be daring with your cartography. Um, so yes, using a styling language called Cardo CSS, uh, you can style any vector data you wish. I said it comes preloaded with, with three Mapbox curated data sets. One of them is that Mapbox Streets that includes the um, OpenStreetMap data. There's uh, Mapbox Terrain, which is a bunch of vector terrain data. Think like contour lines and grades and polygons that represent different grades and elevations, which is really useful, which we'll see in a sec. And, um, the third data set is actually a raster data set of imagery, um, which, uh, just to go on a tangent for a second, the Mapbox satellite team is like totally crazy awesome. One of the projects that they work on is called the Cloudless Atlas. Literally what they're doing is ingesting imagery at all these different zoom levels that we predetermined, and they build algorithms that go through it pixel by pixel determine whether that pixel is a cloud, like from the cloud imagery, and then replace that pixel with the same location in another imagery set, and then do color correction on the whole thing. Wow. So we have a cloudless imagery set of the entire world at a bunch of different zoom levels. I think down to like 17 or something, which is like pretty close. To, it's kind of crazy. And like imagery also it just has this really weird relationship with the US government, where like various different government agencies manage different imagery data sets. So it's like it's like deliberately spread out. One of them is like agriculture, and then like NASA has does the Landsat data, and it's kind of all over the place. And then for the really high zoom levels, we buy imagery from a Digital Globe, who are mostly a government defense contractor, but also do nice things like give out free new imagery when there's natural disasters, um, like in Nepal. They provided a bunch of free imagery for people to trace and put into OpenStreetMap, which is really cool. But that was a massive digression. I'm gonna pause for a second. Do you have any questions so far? Yes, okay, yeah. Okay, so this is kind of referring on to the last thing that you were discussing, and my question is, what about um, citizen data sets? Like if people have their drones, and they say, I'm gonna find my drone, and I'm gonna gather this map data, and it's a really high, is it like higher zoom level than like Google to invite? I'm wondering about you know, privacy issues, and also integrating this Totally. Um, if you own data, I mean, I don't know intimately the like legal ramifications around collecting imagery from drones, um, and definitely don't speak for Mapbox in that. Just cover my for myself. Um, but um, if you own data, like on the whole, if you own data or your agency owns data, um, you can add whatever kind of data you would like to your map using these tools. They're all free, open source, um, and you can put whatever, whether it be vector data or raster imagery data, you can include that in inside of, um, with these tools. Um, in terms of like the privacy and legal stuff, I will, I can like totally ask my coworkers who like really know, and like we can, I'll give you my card and I'll, we'll make sure that I find the answer to that, but I don't know, sorry. You have a question? So when I open the raster data set, how far can you go with just the, the vector data? Uh, yeah, mostly. I okay. mean, so OpenStreetMap, um, I was going to talk about it a little bit, but OpenStreetMap is this um, totally interactive, hands on, user contributed, open source world geographic data set. Uh, it's like Wikipedia, but a giant map of the world, and anyone can edit it. Um, and a lot of people edit it. Bing actually provides imagery to OpenStreetMap for free. Um, so you, anyone can go to osm.org and start tracing things. So a lot of it does originally come from imagery um, or from, um, in the case of like a city's parcel data set or tax lots, 
they probably had like an old flat map that they like scanned and geo-referenced and someone traced. Um, and that's sort of where the geographic data comes from. Um, but the world's changing all the time. So, um, you know, not even just natural disasters, but like buildings going up and coming down and construction and road changes. And so, um, I know, I agree. It's like, <laughs> it's, a little, it's a little intense, but um, I wouldn't say we're beyond imagery, per se. Uh, one second, go over that first, yeah. Uh, so you, sorry, you said the, the Mapbox curated data sets, are those just like available for our use no matter what we want to do with them? Yep. Okay, and it's the, the open street map street data and what else? Um, just... Natural Earth, which is okay. a data set that was created by uh, Nathaniel Kelso, formerly of Stamen and Apple, now we're something called MapZen, and uh, Tom Patterson from the National <coughs> Park Service. So it's this like old school cartographer and this new school cartographer, and they work together to put out these like amazing data sets with political and cultural and physical features and like beautiful hill shades and like, oh, it's gorgeous. Um, so we use some of that data as well. And it creates interesting attribution issues because OpenStreetMap uses the open database license, which is very like, it's, you know, sure, like it's, it's very restrictive and it has, um, we have certain agreements with OpenStreetMap when people use our data and anytime you see a Mapbox map in the bottom right corner, it'll say, you know, copyright OpenStreetMap, and it'll also have a link that says improve this map. And that's part of our agreement with them that we will be constantly asking our users to like help improve the map. But yeah, those data sets are totally free to use within the uh, like terms of service attribution requirements. Yeah. So like overall the data for like mapping the world, how big is that in terms of storage? Um, compressed, it's like 35 gigs right now. Something. Yeah, and that's like, yeah, it's actually, it's not, it's not bad. It's stored in like a weird XML format, so it's like super compact, and it's all like, I'm going to talk about this minute, it was like strangely tag-based and difficult in its own way. But it's comprehensive and cool, it's like, it's neat. My question, uh, two extra questions, one question about, um, so is Mapbox Studio open source? Mapbox GL, or Mapbox JS. Mapbox Studio? Mapbox Studio, uh, yes. It is open source, okay. Yes. Are there other libraries that I can use, like from a, like I'm, I'm working on, but what can I find, like libraries that can manipulate these, uh, like protocol buffers and so forth? Totally. Um, so the like the um, the vector tile spec and standard all open source on GitHub, and we actually build our rendering on top of an open source tool called Mapnic, um, okay. and Mapnic does tile rendering as well. Um, if you go to the, we have like 500 public repos or something, yeah. so if you go to github and um, github.com slash mapbox um, and do a quick search, we have a lot of uh, weird, not weird, kind of awesome like bindings to the different languages depending okay. on where you're trying to work. So if you're not like a C++ hacker, it's cool. Like we have like node bindings for mapnet and um, data transformation stuff, which is really neat. Um, I'm going to keep going and then we'll pause again a little bit for more questions. Um, so. Going back to Mapbox Studio, um, you can um, take this vector data, um, whether it be the Mapbox streets and terrain that comes preloaded, or you can add your own source data if you want to include that additionally in the style. Then, you know, after you style this data, you can upload the style to your Mapbox account and use it in Mapbox.js. Um, and Mapbox accounts are free, up to a certain number of map views, it's like 50,000. Map views, which is like kind of a lot of map views, so but you can kind of go a long way on the free plan. Um, but I actually kind of quite like that as a funding model that like you use more server hosting space and then you pay more. It seems like it makes sense to me. more map views. Anyway, um, so um, in the example that we have here with the with the capital bike share, um, this is what the code looks like when you're actually initializing the map with Mapbox JS. So what uh, we have here is a map constructor, and it is, you know, it's the thing that is a container, it knows what tiles are, it knows what panning and zooming is, it, it has all of these like features and capabilities. And the second um, argument here is actually um, an ID of that style that was created in Mapbox Studio. Um, and then, um, you know, you have all these options of like, do I want to be able to let people zoom both with scrolling and like, what do I want the maximum and minimum zoom levels to be and where do I want it to initialize in the world and what zoom level do I want it to initialize. 
So, um, so when the map container on your page makes a request to, act, to get the map tiles to put in the container, the custom style is being applied to the vector data and then rendered images and then placed in the container. Magic. And this is like the magic of, I think, the, you know, there's always that question of like, you're a company, but you make open source tools. How did you notice the magic? What do you do? I don't understand. Um, and I think it's like the server configuration around like taking this like these protocol buffers, vector data, applying the style, and rendering them quickly, dynamically. Uh, I would say that that's where the magic is for the special sauce or whatever you want to call it. Fairy dust. So um, this is a container, a map container that literally just has these tiles in it. It doesn't have the bike share, it doesn't have any of the routing on it. It's just the tiles that my coworker Duncan made with the roads and bike routes. Um, so you know that those tiles can be used not only in this one application, but anywhere where you can put the tiles in an app container. It's pretty cool. Um, boom, tiles, map, whoa, crazy, awesome. Um, so we have now established over a lengthy period of time that um, this example has tiles in it. But what else does this example do? Uh, well, we have two markers that we can move around. We have our, our origin and our destination points. So I can you know, say, I actually am not over here. I am, <coughs> oh, sorry, I frames. Um, I am down here, and I want to go over here. So these are draggle markers. Seems kind of simple, but like that's another component of this map. So here, we're making a custom little icon style guy. It's got a, let's see, little person on it. Hi, little person. And uh, then uh, we make a new marker, put it at the location, put it on map. We're actually we're not even putting on map here, we're just making the object marker. So in the code, we create a marker icon, which is icon constructor, and then add it to a marker object, and then eventually we add the marker object to the map. Um, but the thing I'm trying to get at here is that like there's all these tiny little pieces in here that are working together, and this is just one of them. And um, you know, not to like spoil the moral of the story, but like you know, you're taking all these little component parts and putting them together. And so, and there are a lot more components I think than we all realize when we look at a map. Um, so, in this code, right, we have like marker color and marker marker symbol, and the way that the um, library knows what marker symbol pitch means and marker size large is that it's using a styling specification um, called Simple Style, also open source, um, that is what we use to create our um, markers and our like default styles for lines and polygons. Um, Maki is also an open source library that Mapbox created, and it's a bunch of little icons that you can add to um, either like your base map or to your markers. So both of these are open source too. You're seeing a pattern yet? Um, <laughs> ha, whoa, pause, are you noticing a pattern? The whole process is made up of tiny self-contained components, many of them open source, that work together to build these seemingly simple mapping applications. I like totally said this, did not even realize this was next on the slides. Anyway. <laughs> um, so in addition to creating the style for the marker, we also give it a location to draw itself. And we tell it, so we tell it like, "Yo, you're gonna be draggable," and then it's like, "All right." Um, <laughs> so this allows us to change the starting point of our trip. And then we create a second marker that has a different style, where it's also draggable for our destination. End marker, call it. And this time, instead of creating an icon in a separate object, we created it right there in the options because people are inconsistent when they write JavaScript. They sometimes do things one way and sometimes do them another. And especially if they're like, you know what, I'm just making this for the blog. I mean, this code isn't even going to be public, except for now. So, um, haha, <laughs> Duncan. <laughs> right? <laughs> he's, he's living the dream, huh? Cool. Um, so, here we're creating um, a marker. And the, it, one interesting thing here, too, is that you see that the first argument is an actual lat long object. And I'm going to get into this in a minute. I think I have like 10 slides about how annoying lat longs are. But just notice that that's an object. It's not just an array of coordinates. It's an object. 
fascinating. Um, so then we have both of those markers to map. Literally, start marker, add to map, end marker, add to map. They are now added to the map. And then like we have a map with tiles and two drag ball markers. Um, so that's cool, right? Tiles, markers, but what else is this doing? It's doing way more than just having markers you can drag around. Although that would be pretty fun, I guess. That's it. It wouldn't do anything, but just... Anyway, um, so what else is happening here? What happens when we drag a marker? What is it doing? It looks like it's finding the closest bike share station. And routing. Oh, and routing. Well, I guess I, was taught, I wrote about routing first anyway, so good on you. So when we move the markers, there are some directions that appear on the map. There are walking directions from the marker itself to the nearest capital bike share station. Um, and then there are cycling directions between those stations that we <coughs> identified. So that's actually four separate things that this map is doing. Remember when I said maps are hard, right? It gets confusing. The first thing it's doing actually is just straight up adding the bike share stations to the map. Um, we hadn't done that yet. So that's the first thing it's doing. Second is it's locating the nearest station to each marker. It's generating walking directions between the markers and the stations. And it's generating bike directions between those stations. So that's four different tasks that this map is doing. In addition to all the ones that it's already doing, like adding tiles and we added the markers. So the bike share stations are housed in a GeoJSON file. As we mentioned before, GeoJSON is an extension of JSON, which stands for JavaScript Object Notation. And it's a series of key value pairs um, the idea of the specification is that it's a very specific set of key value pairs to represent geographic data that web mapping libraries really like. Um, Mapbox.js is um, written on top of a very popular web mapping library called Leaflet. Who here has heard of Leaflet before? From you. Oh, well, <laughs> I have. Here's where Leaflet got from me. Um, so Leaflet um, was created by a gentleman named Vlad who lives in Kiev. Um, it's a colleague of mine. And it was a response to OpenLayers.js, which is another open source web mapping library. It was super bulky. And he was working at a company called CloudMade, and his boss asked him, like, can you like take OpenLayers and like make it faster and better? And so he started tearing apart OpenLayers, and he decided, screw it, I'm just going to write my own. And it's going to be way better and more awesome. And he wasn't really a developer either. But he like built this like crazy thing just because he needed to. It's like a testament to like, yes, you are a programmer, damn it. You write codes. They work sometimes. That makes you a programmer. <laughs> uh, but uh, so he called Leaflet because it was so much more lightweight than any of the other libraries out there. That's why it's called Leaflet. Ooh, I probably should have gotten more sleep. Um, <laughs> so because GeoJSON is just JavaScript, it can easily be used in web maps, which is super awesome and cool. Saw this lovely slide before. This is from a GeoJSON data set of map time chapters. We'll talk about map time at the end. Um, but GeoJSON, series of key value pairs with very specific pieces. Um, so things like a geometry object that says what type of feature it is and what coordinates um, are part of it. As yeah, so it's it's specific and that's really helpful. Um, so the example that in our little bike share example, it's using a library called jQuery to load the GeoJSON asynchronously and then add the points with marker objects. And um, hard part, this is kind of fun because I'm talking to people who, for the most part, are like somewhat technical. Um, the way harder way to teach this is to talk to people who know a lot about maps and don't know a ton about programming because async is like stupid hard to conceptualize and think about like, so I'm asking it to do something, but I'm not waiting for it to be done. I'm just going to go and do another thing, and then when it's done, it's going to do another thing. It's really confusing to follow and frustrating. Um, but like, if you learn JavaScript through making maps, then you like have like a very tough education very quickly in like the weird ways of the internet and JavaScript and strangeness. So yay, async. It's great. Um, so what, uh, what this example is doing is it's saying, all right, I'm going to asynchronously grab this GeoJSON file. When I have it, I'm going to check to make sure it's JSON. Oh, cool. Then I am going to make a little icon called inactive station. 
um, that is, you know, a little, little circle, little green circle. And then for each feature in that GeoJSON object, which is an array of features, add it to the map with that style that I defined. So that's going through the file one by one, each location, and adding it to the map of the map. Now, I'm going to digress again, but this one's planned. Uh, so this is one of the many silly nuances of web mapping. So if you look back, we're going to show this code again. Look at what's going on with the latitude and longitude here at the end. So what it's doing is it's actually taking the GeoJSON and flipping the coordinates. And it's saying, all right, GeoJSON, your coordinates are backwards for a lot marker. A lot marker wants them in the other <laughs> order. There is much disagreement in the web mapping world about whether or all the world about whether coordinates should be written in lat long or long lat. And then you have like the math mathematicians who are like, uh, if you think about it like a Cartesian plane, it should be long lat because the x is you know. People get really heated about it. It's really dumb. So GeoJSON <laughs> prefers longitude latitude, but Leaflet and Mapbox.js, which is an extension of Leaflet, prefer lat long. Um, and so in part of Mapbox.js, and it's, the reason it exists is to make it easy for Leaflet to interact with Mapbox's infrastructure. But in doing that, we've created a bunch of methods and, and objects and constructors that extend Leaflet to make things like this less annoying. Also things like loading in files externally. Like we have a bunch of functions that have built in Ajax. Because these things are like unnecessarily confusing. And you shouldn't have to shouldn't have to worry about whether it's lat long or long lat. And I guarantee if you try to go and make a web map, at least once in your life, you're going to end up with like, why are my coordinates in Saudi Arabia? They're supposed to be in Serbia. Mm -hmm. Don't understand. And it's you'd probably this issue. Those actually are those. It's about the only example I know off the top of my head where the two flipped are those locations. So yeah, this is annoying. But anyway, that's just so again, we look at the puppy to make ourselves feel better about the annoying lack of standards in open source. And uh, move forward. So once the bike share locations are added to the map, we have to locate the nearest one to our origin and our destination. To do this, we're using another awesome open source library called TurfJS. Turf is one of my favorite things in the world um, because I like JavaScript and I like spatial analysis, and I wrote the documentation, so I know it really well. Um, but um, so what Turf does is it takes a bunch of really old spatial analysis operations, which is just like straight up geometry, right? Like what is the closest thing from here to here? And how many of these things are inside of this other thing? And what area are they intersecting? So these, what are these two areas? What's their intersection? What's the area of that? Things like that. Um, so the spatial analysis library, spatial analysis is used to describe relationships between geographic data, um, which is like the most concise definition I could